the true value of the creator economy is rooted in engagement and education. Hello and welcome to a new episode of the Influence Factor by the Influencer Marketing Factory. Today with me, we have Jerry Wan, that is the founder of Just Like Media and Always Be Creating. If you're new to the show, I've been listening, you know, uh, for a few episodes right now, I wanted to invite you to subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and YouTube, so you won't lose any new episode coming up every Wednesday morning. Enjoy the show. Hey, Jerry, welcome to the show. How are you? I'm doing well. Thanks for having me. Um, it's, it's, it's great to talk about the creator economy. It, it seems like it's changing every day, every hour. Uh, but really excited to share this time with you to to talk about all the wonderful things in, in the creator world and storytelling and, and building communities with you. Absolutely. You're totally right. Uh, you know, I do agree. Every single day, there is something new, a new platform, a new feature. Social media coming out with like, hey, we're doing this program, you know. So sometimes it's difficult even to just be on top of it, right? But uh, first of all, why don't you tell us a bit more about yourself, you know, um, about your career so far, what you're building, so we can have an idea, right, about yourself. Sure. Uh, I primarily am a creative entrepreneur. I have a storytelling media company. We produce podcasts. I also speak for a living. I coach other people how to speak. And in the creator economy, I create content. And also we have built a private community to elevate and amplify Asian content creators. And so although those may seem like different things, I live at the intersection of empowering people to own their story and then to help build businesses around what their story is in an effort to help inspire other people to do the same and really be proud of who they are and to really recognize that who we are actually makes our story wonderful, uh, resonant, and valuable to the world. I like this. You know, storytelling, it's very important uh, with the creative economy, right? Uh, it's not just anymore going there, you know, post on something. You know, people want to see the behind the scenes, right? They want to know about yourself, right? People don't buy any more products just because of the product. They buy because of the person that is like, you know, behind that, right? So we'll go more in detail there. But uh, um you uh, you specifically, if I'm right, like you know, you uh, focus on all, on a lot of like you know, Asian American stories. Is is that correct? Um, and, and if so, like first of all, like you know, why, right? Like is there something that like maybe you know you saw other stories that were like you know very uh, you know uh, engaging for you and you know got passionate about that and wanted also to get others. And, and then after that, also my second question is, uh, can you share like the two or three that you love the most so far that you learn about? Yeah, you know, um, I was born in Korea. I came here when I was eight, um, now 40. So we're talking 30 plus years ago. And I think most, like m- many other uh, immigrant children or children of immigrants or refugees, adoptees, you know, we were taught really to come to America and to try to assimilate and to fit in. And, you know, fitting in meant a lot of different things to a lot of different people. And what we sort of missed, and no fault of our parents, was learning the nuanced and the culturally resonant life and business lessons that other people who challenge, who, who experience similar challenges a, as we did, uh, could share. And so thinking back to, you know, 20 years ago when I was in college, we had a lack of two different things. One, there were not enough ample stories of people from the community who could share these life and business lessons because there weren't a, a lot of people, as many as there are today, doing non-traditional creative things. And then two, from a technical distribution perspective, here we are recording a podcast from different parts of the country. We didn't have this, right? So 20 years ago, if you wanted to write something, a magazine or newspaper needed to give you permission. You wanted a TV show, somebody had to give you permission. You wanted to speak, you needed a radio show. And so between that and now, the world has really democratized content and anybody can create anything that they want. And ultimately what that does is it gives us the ability to go find our listener. Because if you are talking to a national TV channel, for example, and I say, hey, I want to share Asian American stories, their first response is going to be, well, how big is that market? And so when we think about how big that market is, then we get sort of limited into this corner to say, well, 23 million people is still a lot of people. But when you have to program a national TV channel, for example, it's not as big. And so what the internet really has allowed us to do through podcasts and YouTube and social media is to find our tribe and find our audiences that may not be big enough or quote unquote target market big enough to move the needle on some traditional media. So that's been really wonderful. And and so for me, it was looking around and thinking about who gave me advice and was that advice relevant to the position that I was coming from. And so there's business and life advice that is universally acceptable. 
And then there are different buckets of advice or different uh, layers of advice that I think are very different depending on what your background is. And that certainly has to do with cultural values that we have to overcome or to unlearn and relearn. It also has to do with that the way that we tr get treated in the world. And so, you know, women get treated differently than men in certain cases, different folks, depending on your identity, do. And so um, it's not to say that our advice is any better or worse, but we need different advice for different people. And so uh, this, I, I started this project um, mainly through our The Years in Americans podcast roughly four years ago. And really it was, how do we make sure that our stories that we are experiencing today get to be left for my kids and other kids and even ourselves as we go? Um, as it relates to sort of, you know, the, the stories that sort of hit uh, still resonant to me, it, it, it's wild because we're, we're getting close to 200 episodes. And so we've heard from a, a very, very wide array of Asian American stories and some Asian folks, not American across the world. And it's this notion of, I didn't even know being Asian American myself, I'm Korean American, to understand how diverse and rich some of these experiences were and how much we don't learn about people's experiences. And so um, not individual stories, but I'll share two types of stories that I don't think we learn very much about here in America. One is the experience of the refugee. So I've had the pleasure of having people on the show who were actual children on boats being helicoptered out uh, in refugee camps, resettling here, you know, being in towns where they're the only non-white family, having to go through all these struggles and they come with nothing because they are refugees of war. We don't tell that story. I think the only times that we hear about refugees is when there's this really miraculous story of victory and of triumph. And we use words like resilience to say, wow, they made it. We don't tell the stories of the average refugee, how much pain and trauma they go through. And on the other side, another part of our community that we don't actually speak often about are the adoptees. And so there's a tremendous number of, in the hundreds of thousands of uh, inter, uh, transcontinental and transracial adoptees here in the States. So many children from Korea, China, uh, Vietnam, and other places are adopted here, uh, primarily by white parents. And they're finally getting their stories told, right? And so it's, it's very humbling to understand that my experience, which is a valid Korean and Asian American experience, is very different because I admittedly am privileged. I was not a refugee. I was not an adoptee. I, uh, I am educated. I am a straight man. Um, and, and so even challenging the notion of what it means to be us, I, I think has been very humbling. Um, and, you know, we've had the wonderful honor of having some amazing people on the show. Uh, my biggest name or my proudest one is Vice President Kamala Harris. Uh, she was on the show. That was super cool. Um, and I've had, you know, and then on the other side, I've had my cousin who nobody knows except our family. Uh, but his story was super awesome too, because there are people who would resonate with his story of a Korean kid being born in Arkansas, being raised in Arizona and the challenges that he faced. Right. And so um, all of our stories are unique, but there are resonant threads that we can weave through and to say, man, I, I don't, I am not a refugee. I have know nothing about that person, but I, I feel like I can, you know, uh, understand where they're coming from. Of course. So that's you don't need the famous person, you need the relatable person, right? That can tell the story comes from the heart, right? And many others, even just feeling like I'm not alone, right? Others have been there and they did it, they made it. So I can do it as well, right? So I love the message and thank you for sharing like, you know, these these experiences. I'm pretty sure that you have like, you know, so many stories that you heard that are like, you know, either heartbreaking, but also like, you know, that can give you the energy, right? Just to be like, okay, you know, I can do it. And uh you know, in addition to that, uh, as there are many differences, culturally speaking, you know, in terms of like mindset and in terms of like, you know, experiences, in terms of politics and so on, um, we won't go in that because again, it's not like, you know, about politics and news, uh, but it's more about the creator economy. So I wanted to ask you and, you know, uh, what are the differences, right? When it comes to the creator economy between Asian countries and, and the US, uh, we all know, of course, about social media, right? Uh, how they are different uh, when it comes to social commerce, like shopping and so on. But when it comes to like, people, so content creators, and the content online, have you noticed any differences? What works? What doesn't? What are the main differences out there? I, I, there are many differences, right? I think one, there's the, mm -hmm. the technical difference of the platforms that people get to use. There are things that people have different capabilities. Um, there are a lot of platforms in Asia, for example, that are far advanced in social shopping and America is trying to catch up, as an example. Uh, but I think that the largest one is sort of 
how do you feel relative to what we would consider the main audience in your country? Right. And so mm. if you're a Korean uh, Instagram person or a YouTuber and your primary audience is Korea, you're part of the majority, right? You're trying to find just demographical differences to be able to resonate and to try to hit sort of a, an audience. I, I think the additional challenge of, of being an Asian American creator um, is sort of choosing how much of your identity you want to have played in your creator business. Right. And so there are, you know, and again, uh, not all creators should or need to have their identity as an integral part of their content, right? And so we don't want to play this game of, well, you're an Asian creator, you're a Black creator, you're an LGBTQ creator, so that's all we see you for. And so yeah. it, it is sort of this balance of how do you see yourself as a greater part? And so there are some creators that are extremely funny, that are educational, that do well, and regardless of their identity. And there are other creators whose content and whose sort of brand is predicated upon the experiences that they go through. And neither is wrong, neither is right. It's just how do you want to infuse your identity with that? I think in Asian uh, countries, folks don't have to do that as much because most Asian countries are still very homogeneous. The language is the same. The belief systems are broadly the same. And so they don't have to go through the additional sort of thinking process of, um, you know, race, gender, and other sort of things that may uh, not completely change, but sort of tweak how we want to uh, view things. Um, also, I think the other part as it relates to that is the brand deal opportunities sort of on the business end of things might be different. So a lot of uh, creators of color or creators from different marginalized groups often have to rely on budgets that are meant for multicultural marketing or a sub budget of some sort. I would imagine that, you know, creators in China, Korea, or other places, that's their mainstream budget, right? They don't have to fight for a diversity budget. They're not being asked to only, you know, so one of the things that many Asian creators, uh, it is good and bad, but you know, May is Asian American heritage month. And so we get a lot of opportunities then. Um, if you're a Chinese content creator in China, you don't have that. You're not being, you know, uh, pigeonholed or, or just sequestered to one month. You're who you are all month. So I, I think there's sort of the the, the nuanced differences there. Um, but what's really interesting, though, is that Asian American content creators are wildly popular in their home countries, right? And and we sometimes find about there's this um, crossover that happens. And so um, I have some friends that have wildly popular seven-figure podcasts. And when they lift the hood and look at their data, they say, whoa, you know, uh, India is actually our biggest country of listens because they, they, though they're not from here, they resonate with somebody who looks like them, feels like them, has a similar name. And, and so, you know, it's, I, I think we're just at the tip of the iceberg. Um, when, when I think about the Asian creator economy broadly, it's not 6% of America, it's 60% of the world and how we can use our stories to really empower everybody. Um, and, and the the market opportunities, you know, in, in a globalized world and, and social media, I think it's going to be even more robust. I know we're still thinking very America centric at times with platforms and with access and marketing. But, you know, um, I, I think we're, we're moving towards every day in sort of a, an even playing field or the same playground for all content creators globally. Hello. Is your brand ready to amplify its reach? Well, the Influencer Marketing Factory is here to do just that. We are a global influencer marketing agency helping brands ignite their growth from influencer identification to campaign strategy, handling legalities and agreements to managing shipping and logistics we have it all covered. We work with hundreds of brands across different verticals from Fortune 500 companies to DTC brands. And we don't just stop there. With detailed ROI analysis, we help brands like yours measure success, transforming impressions into actionable conversions. You can find us at theinfluencermarketingfactory.com or just search the Influencer Marketing Factory on Google. And you know, if uh, on the one hand there are differences, right? Uh, there are also similarities. And one of them is uh, that no matter where you're like, you know, live, uh, can be, you know, an Asian country, can be in the US, can be even in Europe, where I'm from, many parents, right? <laughs> they still don't understand, right? That being a content creator is a full-time job. It requires skills, it requires patience, it requires efforts. They're still, I guess, that they want you to be either just a doctor or an engineer, right? Like, you know, so like, sort of like, you know, old school traditional ways and paths, right? Why is that that, that people still have to fight? Uh, or let's say, you know, go against their parents that has to be like, you know what, actually, this is a career. This is what I want to do. 
You know, I, I think it all comes from a good place. So I, I think there's two shifts that happened. Um, uh, one shift happens every generation, regardless of where you are, and that's the generational change, mm-hmm. right? And so, you know, yes. our parents probably gripe about the way that their parents or our grandparents raised them because the world changed so quickly. Um, what what a lot of immigrants, immigrant parents had to do was do that and then do a cultural change. And so the world has changed so much in the last 20 years. And they have to then understand the different opportunities and the different economies that are changing. Um, a lot of immigrant parents don't get to participate in the mainstream economy. They're busy running their small businesses in their cultural areas. And so they're not reading the Wall Street Journal, right? They don't, they don't go to conferences. They don't understand as well how the business world is changing because they're not actively participating. Many of them did not go to school here. And so that also plays a role. And so when I think parents want the best for us, it's, it's with a sort of an asterisk. It is the best that they want for us, given the world that they grew up in and in the context that made sense for them. And so I'll speak from my Korean experience. My parents were born in the 50s, a decade after the war ended. And so Korea back then looked very different than it does today. We think of Korea as this technology beacon and this sort of cool everything about culture and, and with economic opportunity, regardless of what you do. 40 years ago, that was not the, or, you know, back when my parents were being born and raised 60 years ago, that was not the case. Right. And so back then, and and most uh, developing countries go through this, education was the only way out. Right. And so if you became a lawyer, if you became an engineer, if you became a doctor or in the business sense, if you work for a big company like Samsung and you did a 40 year career there, that was not the easiest path, but it was the most uh, predictable path to get your family onto a better trajectory. So, and then when they moved here, they applied those same principles to the American context and said, wait a minute, there are better schools like Harvard. There are more medical schools. And so that's what they did. They said, we know this works back home. If you become a doctor, your life is good. So do that, right? And so, and I think, you know, uh, for, for many, you know, immigrant refugee parents and even a lot of my friends, we operate from a position of building stability and we don't have the privilege many times to take the risk that could pay off. And so, you know, I, I have two very young children. They're six and four. Like, I don't want anything bad for them. I want what's best for them, right? And so I I, I think it just comes from a, a lack of understanding of how the world is changing, how the new opportunities are, because all that's, you know, every parent wants stability and safety for their kids. And so when, you know, I, I think it took my parents like two years Alessandra to figure out what I do for a living. And, mm. you know, it was really, it wasn't until I got invited to the White House last year for the work that I did. They're like, oh, you're doing something cool, you know, and you're taking care of your kids. And like, that's cool. Like, that's meaningful. Right. Um, but they don't. How do we expect our parents to know, you know, who are in their 60s and even older uh, to understand this new world? Um, it, they didn't grow up with it. It's foreign to them. It's It's weird. Um, and so, you know, I, I think it's, un- unfortunately, we have to prove through some case studies of success to point to that. And so, and then that's where the storytelling piece comes back, right? And so it's one part being successful at trying this new thing in this new world. And then we have to come back and being able to share what we learned and the processes that we went through so that it makes it easier, not only for the next kid to go through that, but then we need to also share those stories with the parents so that they're not as alarmed and they're not as, you know, anxious about it. Still on the, you know, young people, uh, right, that they want to make this a career, uh, plenty of them were at Bitcoin, right, uh, uh, as, as, you know, as any years. You you were also there at Bitcoin, Correct, right? yeah. Fantastic. We, we both went, you know, and uh, on that note also, like, we do we did our, an episode with Colin Hickey, that is the SVP of Bitcoin. It was a very interesting one to see how, you know, it started as a, you know, hey, let's bring together YouTubers, right, in a room, uh, and and is the success, right, that is that is today. What are your takeaways? So what are the things that you like the most, uh, and what do you think that the creator economy is missing out right now? I I think that we are moving towards a world where the creator economy is no longer a siloed economy. You can't run a marketing campaign without involving the creator economy. Every founder has to be a creator at this point. And whether you agree with that statement or not, you can't start a company right now without both having a social presence for the thing and yourself. 
because sales 101, people don't buy logic, people buy an emotion and people buy on personal connection. What the creator economy allows brands, companies, movements to do is to put that human being in between the thing and their customer base. And through what the creator creates through content is to evoke an emotion to make a decision of some sort, whether it is to buy something, to donate something, or to vote one way or another. That's what it does. And so the creator economy as a, a siloed thing, I don't think is a conversation anymore, right? And then, uh, you know, we're recording this in the middle of the WGA and the SGA strike, and now there are being additional guidelines for the first time ever on how content creators should act and to avoid, you know, getting, um, you know, uh, having, having their uh, future careers as actors, you know, at risk or whatever, all these things, right? And so that I think is wonderful. And so when we go to these conferences now, it's no longer just the weird YouTube guys. It's everybody, major brands, entertainment brands, consumer brands, they're all there trying to figure out sort of how we can move the needle, right? And so um, there are content creators who can, in their own niches, move the needle on purchases or ticket sales for things far greater than our even A-list Hollywood stars would. And so how marketers begin to leverage that, I think is really, really exciting. Um, and so, you know, you go to, and, and, and the takeaway is that the creator economy is everywhere, right? How are you going to take the best parts of it? How are you going to leverage the pieces of it that you want to leverage? Because it's no longer, oh, those we are teenagers doing dances on TikTok. That's no longer. And if you continue to think that you're way behind, there are people making great income, selling what they know online. There are people helping somebody else become more confident online. And so I, I think that's wonderful. You know, what, what I, what I think is, is missing. Um, it, it, it's tough to say, I, I think, um, you know, community is missing and, and we're doing something about it. Other people are doing something about it. Um, the creator economy is also because it's so vague, um, and, and almost undefinable at this point. If you're a creator, there's no handbook to do this, this, and this. It's not a direct mm -hmm. linear path. And so how we can teach the right people to uh, build careers in a way that is sustainable, um, you know, I think there's with something like the creator economy uh, also does invite a lot of, you know, unscrupulous players to, um, you know, take advantage of people and to teach bad things. And so cr community sort of is the antidote there, right? You can share data, um, make sure that you're getting compensated fairly. You're, you're learning new things to to operate in a way. And so, um, you know, we're, we're building that for, for our creators in our space. I know other people are doing wonderful things and, um, there are now creator economy businesses purely built on this notion of connecting people because creator journey, like mud, many entrepreneurial journeys, uh, can get quite lonely. And it is a, a place where, you know, you're in front of your camera the whole time, or you have to project this character that you built online. And sometimes, not all, but sometimes it is uh, challenging or difficult to be uh, authentic and to be vulnerable at times. And so um, I, I, I think that's, you know, the, so to, to sort of boil it down, you know, how do we take care of the humans and the creator economy going forward and to make sure that they're taking care of their mental health, that they're well, that they don't fall into sort of, you know, uh, perpetual uh, never feeling adequate because of comparison mode, um, all, all those things. And I think that is a, uh, a thing that both platforms have to be mindful of, that brands have to be aware of so they're not being exploitative with their uh, content creators. And then creators themselves have to, you know, set boundaries, making making sure that they can uh, sustain their businesses and, and, and to make sure that there's some distance between my life and my creator business. Because um, I think sometimes those lines get blurred. Very interesting. And I'm going to ask you a bit, a bit more later. You know? Sure. Uh, about how, you know, content creators can help each other and support each other. Similar to, you know, entrepreneurs, right? Uh, an entrepreneur that talks with someone that, with a nine-to-five is a bit difficult sometimes just to understand each other, right? So yeah. that's why entrepreneurs talk with other entrepreneurs and that's why content creators talk with other content creators. We're, we're going to go, you know, there uh, in a second. But before doing that, I really like what you say about that, you know, being a content creator is not an, is a non-direct path, right? That's, you learn as you go. There, there are no books about how to become a content creator. If they are, come on, you know, you know what I mean. Like, you know, it's it's one of those things that you 
it, it changes as we mentioned at the beginning. It changes every day. So theory, many times doesn't apply, right? Only practice apply to this type of work. And something that I noticed is that many content creators are very good in front of the camera when they are alone in their room, but because they are still learning, right? They never really learn maybe how to speak in public, right? And I know that you help people doing that. Um, what are some of the best tips uh, that you could share with us today? Let's say that, again, you are a content creator and you got invited to an event um, in front of hundreds of people that might listen to you. Um, how do you prepare to give a keynote that can be successful and people are going to clap at you and they're going to share about you on LinkedIn or social media? You know, we have to be able to share both content and context, right? So um, content is readily available online. Um, you know, I always tell people if they can Google you or if they can look up the answers to something, that should mm -hmm. be, that should not be the thing that you share on a stage, right? Um, and, and so what I mean by that is being able to share a story or a conversation as we're doing now live without, you know, a, a script is, is really unique and gives us the op opportunity to uh, speak from our hearts without canned answers. And so content creators often, because of the pressures of the algorithm and all these things, you know, they stick to a script and they say, this is what I'm going to say. Um, I, I think what people also want to know for a lot of creators is how are you, who are you as a human being? Tell me the backstory. Tell me your process. What do you go through that? What do you think about the, the decision-making process that goes into, you know, doing one thing versus another? And again, there are so many different uh, case studies on what success looks like that the answer is everything and nothing at all. And, and so it really comes down to context of the person. So there are podcasters, for example, that do really well with, you know, two, three hour long conversations. And then there are people on the other side saying 30 second TikToks are the only way to go. And they're both right. And so how are we going to use this opportunity when you're given the opportunity to share, to go beyond the clip and to go beyond the highlight reel? And so in, in, in terms of that, you know, so that's what I would say in, in the beginning. And in the second part, as far as, you know, uh, steps is really put yourself in the audience, right? Because again, nobody wakes up one day and they go from zero to a million followers. There's a process in a journey and everybody's in a different part of the journey. Nobody, no two people are on the exact same time frame on, on their creator journey. And there's no two days where you're the same. And so I think it's just reflecting on what would I have liked to have learned two weeks ago, two years ago, uh, five years ago in my own journey and to be that person. And again, so this is where context really, you know, plays a role because how you got there isn't necessarily going to be the same for everybody in the audience, but people will look at you and they will resonate with you on a certain level based on whether it's your background or your content uh, pillar or sort of your professional background or your academic journey to be able to resonate with you in a way to be able to um, do that, right? And so that's where I, I think, you know, I, I would focus on. Um, sure, there are, there are tactical things in terms of, you know, creating, crafting a speech or to, you know, start with a story. Um, but again, just sort of in the same vein, you can Google all that stuff and, and to learn how to give the world's best TED Talk at 18 minutes or, few, or, or shorter. Um, and so, you know, the thing that I would like to share is they're there for a reason. The audience has given up their most precious resource, which is time in exchange for your words. And so how are you going to honor that by giving them something that they can't get anywhere else? Right. And so content is the same, you know, um, often we get lost in this world of comparative follower counts and downloads and stuff. Look, if you had a hundred people in a, in a auditorium listening to every word you said, that's ridiculous. That's so cool. But in online, we're like 100, 100 listens, lame, right? Because we always, yeah. we, 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 we get, uh, right. yeah, we get blinded by this, the big fuzzy numbers. But even if it's 30, a 30 is the average size of all the classrooms we ever went to school in. And how much did we learn from the teacher and how much impact did that teacher have on all of us when the audience was only 30? And so it's about the impact, not the size of the audience. And so again, it's sort of, you know, um, understanding that you are being given this really uh, amazing opportunity and this gift to share 
and that we should handle that with with all the care and and you know um you know care and thought in the world as we share these stories i like when you also say you know start with a story right because maybe you have 10 minutes and maybe you can dedicate one or couple right for a personal story as a icebreaker is gonna you know maybe you can talk after about you know technical things statistics and numbers but how can you actually show yourself to the public right if you are not really open yourself so thank you for sharing that that, that tip i think that one it's uh it's very good one. I'm also taking notes where you say all these things. So I will also apply on the, on the next, you know, public speaking. And, you know, still continue on tips. You also, if I'm correct, you also organize an event uh, called, you know, leverage, Leveraging LinkedIn uh, to build a powerful and profitable personal brand. Um, also in this case, like, do you have any any tips to share with us? Either you are a content creator or, you know, someone is just entering in the creator economy or even if you're like a professional that had, Maybe, you know, they have uh, their full-time job that is, again, you know, maybe could be a typical, you know, uh, job you can know about, but maybe on the side that they also decided to, hey, I have this knowledge, why don't I share this on YouTube Shorts, LinkedIn, TikTok, and so on. Some tips for us? Yeah, I, I, I genuinely think LinkedIn is the most powerful free thing in the universe to help any business grow because, one, the amount of processes that LinkedIn goes through to make sure that every person on there is a real human being, uh, I think is better than most other platforms, right? You have to share your real name, your own background. I mean, some people get away with it, but for the most part, people are coming to LinkedIn with more uh, genuine authenticity and our guard down rather than on other platforms where you can just pick a random name, put a cartoon up as your profile pic, and nobody knows who you are. And so it, it's also a more supportive place because for those reasons of the, the visible authenticity and sort of the verifiable identity, there are, le- there are fewer trolls, there's less negativity. And so it's a more, you know, generally uh, encouraging place. It does also come with this sort of expectation that we don't share everything because they're work friends. Or, you know, if you work for a large company, you don't want your coworkers or your managers to see yourself in a certain way. So so there, there are both things. However, um, I, I think it's the most powerful thing because it I think there are more people, the average person on LinkedIn, is far more capable and willing to help build businesses for you and to provide support than the average follower on any other platform. And so I have gotten speaking opportunities that are literal DM saying, we followed you, we love you, we love what you speak about. Are you available to come speak to our organization on this day? I have friends who've gotten brand deals. I myself have been invited to be a part of a LinkedIn photo shoot. So this is really funny, but I am a LinkedIn stock photo boy somewhere in some marketing campaign in some office in LinkedIn world. I've been asked to partner with them to create content for um, Asian Pacific American Heritage Month last year. And so wonderful things happen, but you have to put your story out there, right? And so it is no longer, it has never really been, but it is no longer a place where it's just a virtual resume. It is a place to share your thoughts. And when you share your thoughts, and again, the unique part about LinkedIn is that it's not, there's no, you know, crap posting. There's no, it's, it's, it's gotta be genuine. It's gotta be with a professional lens. And so when you put your authentic self, whether it's vulnerable or talking about your own journey in that professional sense, people will resonate. People will listen. People will read. People will follow. People will comment. And that actually builds far stronger, genuine relationships that seem less transactional. Because now then once you follow each other, you also know your mutual friends, where other people have worked. There's a little bit of credibility building, right? And for for all that we say about creator economy, about your content being sort of your resume, people still do care in the business world of where you worked, who your network is, where you went to school, all these things. And so that verifies it. And so the reason I believe LinkedIn is, is such a powerful tool is that all those things come standard, Right. You meet somebody on Instagram or you somebody say like, hey, DM me on Instagram. You really don't know as much as about, uh, much about them and they don't know about as you. And so LinkedIn is really a, a really wonderful tool. The profile page is like 20 different things that you can really leverage to showcase things about you without making it seem braggy. Because if it happened in real life, then it's happened. Um, and so, and again, the, the commerce that happens or the business opportunities that are sparked from LinkedIn because everybody comes to network, everybody has a business mind, is, is really, really wonderful. And I will say, 
that the average creator, particularly the ones that uh, live primarily on sort of the video first or short form first content platforms, have not leveraged the ability to build business partnerships at, on LinkedIn. Um, I have some friends that literally take their TikToks and put it on LinkedIn and they do really well. Um, you know, it is also not the most serious place in the world. There's a lot of humor and levity because for some, being a comedian is their business. So who are we to say this is for professionals? Well, if you make if you're a musician, then your music belongs on LinkedIn because that is your profession. If you're if content creation is your profession, then you should bring that authentic self to this place because it, and again, people um, 930 million active users on LinkedIn, uh, only 16% are daily active users. And so if you are one of the you know, very few people that are actually on LinkedIn every day, you're coming to engage. You're coming not to laugh. You're coming to connect. You're coming to learn. Um, and so I, I think it's a really, really wonderful place. I've been fortunate enough and I've been blessed to have built most of my businesses uh, leveraging LinkedIn. I've met business partners on LinkedIn. I have met friends on LinkedIn. I have, um, it is a running joke amongst my peer set that everybody in Jerry's life he's met on LinkedIn. Uh, not my wife. I met her in person, but uh, most everybody else who has who is playing a critical role in my business and my uh, creator journey, I've actually met on LinkedIn, or that's where we primarily keep in touch. Um, and so it's it's been wonderful. So uh, my my advice there is to start start today and then figure out wh- how you can. Um, you know, we always have this fear of well, what if nobody reads my stuff, right? And my follow up question is, if you never post it, they're not going to read it anyway. So you yeah. have to post it to give yourself a chance to read. And of course, amongst creators, we, we talk about the power of the first post or power of just posting and, and all the time. Um, and look, if nobody reads it, cool. Well, you, you're, you're back to square one. Um, but it does have the opportunity, in my opinion, uh, to really connect real human beings in, in a business sense. Um, and so if you haven't posted on LinkedIn, um, I would clean up your profile, spend some time there. There's a lot of great free resources out there to do so. There are other communities and courses and coaches that can help you sort of beef that up. Um, and, and I think it's always going to be worth worth the investment. Yeah, you know, just thoughts, right? Uh, again, like, you know, it's, uh, even if it flop or whatever, get busy by two people at the beginning, then just consistency is going to help. And also like now with the creator mode, right? You can have yeah. so many more tools. We did another episode with Daniel Markowitz that works at LinkedIn where we analyze those, all those things, you know. By the way, it sounds like a YouTuber. You can click here for this episode, you know, like it sounds like, you know, just sending people different links here, you know, but just to say that it means that we analyze and uh, I do I agree. I also myself have the creator mode on. Uh, and um, yeah, if you're not on LinkedIn sharing content, uh, like you're missing out a lot. So um, I have a last question for you that we already were discussing a bit, you know, earlier. And it's about, you know, helping, you know, creators helping other creators, right? Um, you have a private membership, right? Where you help creators, uh, and so uh, how, how can the creators usually support each other? Is it like sharing uh, knowledge? It is uh, sending each other's like uh, brand deals, uh, opportunities. It is uh, uh, understanding about the financials behind their work. Is it about even maybe just like, you know, emotional, I would say, you know, support between each other. Is that, what is the TikTok thing that you see happening in your private community? It's all of that. I think people are scared to talk about money in public. People are scared to talk about challenges in public. Um, you know, most content creators, primary circle of friends aren't content creators. And so if you are, you know, in, in our, uh, I just turned 40. So most of my friends I went to school with aren't creating content, nor are they entrepreneurs in the creator economy space. I can't talk to my friends who are professionals in finance and consulting or medical fields about the challenges that I go through. They simply don't get it. Even in the public speaking world, you know, thinking about, hey, I was offered this contract to do the speaking opportunity for X dollars. It, it's a world that's completely foreign to them. There are things that I think that are fundamentally challenging for people to talk about. There are things that are outside of my world. So I primarily exist in the LinkedIn world, the public speaking world, uh, podcasting, although we're, we're sort of pivoting away from that. I am not as deep or as knowledgeable about short form video, about uh, trends on TikTok and other places, because part of it is it's impossible to be great at everything. And so one, it's bringing people together 
And again, our community, the thread in our community is you don't have to be Asian, but you have to be genuinely on the same page and dedicated and committed to amplifying and elevating Asian content creators. And so we have people who are executives at creator platforms. We have people that have millions of followers on a variety of different platforms. And it is really to come to say, like, how do we help each other in whatever ways that we can? So that's education, that's engagement, and that's empowerment. And so the engagement part is really interesting because people just want friends. And this is not a paid for friends sort of a thing. It is being able to invest in yourself to be in a pre-vetted community that not everybody just gets to come to. Uh, there's a lot of wonderful free groups out there. I happen to be of the belief that free leads to quick burnout. And it is really hard to value free. And if you want to get really nerdy, anything in the world divided by zero is an incomputable number. And so it doesn't compute. And so we want people to take themselves seriously, invest in it. We invest back into the community by bringing guest speakers, by providing in-person and virtual opportunities. Uh, we bring in people that are experts in publishing, experts in YouTube, experts in, you know, um, we, we have next month coming in or our friend from Kajabi to share about how they can sell their content and to build their own membership businesses. And so it is really, you know, at the end of the day, giving educational opportunities for people to learn how to do that. Uh, we also get, you know, we're not an agency, but from time to time, we get opportunities to do affiliate stuff or to do brand deals. And if we can't do it, we pass it along. Um, you know, we obsess over culture. And so I know everybody wants to talk about scale and grow, grow, grow. Uh, we take a different view on it. Um, I one-on-one -on -one interview every single person who applies to join the community, which is a very laborious and, and pain, you know, time consuming process. But if somebody's entrusting us with financial dollars to join, that comes with the responsibility on our end to make sure that their peers are not going to, uh, you know, waste their time or to do other things. And so, you know, that's how we build it. And, and we hope that by the time we get to, you know, 100, 200 members that the culture will take care of itself and that we become this powerful movement. Um, it is it is no different than the reason why people join country clubs or organizations like Soho House or Chief. You're, go, you're, you're trusting that the process and the system works so that the people that you bump into, whether it is a virtual setting or an in-person location or somebody that can help you and that you're, there's a lot of resonance and connectivity there. Um, and again, for, for us, the, the, the added layer is going back to what we were talking about earlier, Alessandro, is, you know, we probably have similar parents who've told us same, same things. And again, so the question is, how the hell do your parents, how the hell do you tell your parents what to do for a living? I don't know. What did you do? <laughs> you know? Um, and so it is, it is, uh, uh, and again, it, it, it provides me a home, right? Like, um, and, and it's been a good thing, both, um, you know, uh, from a tactical perspective, practical perspective, educational, but also from uh, a, a psychological perspective to know that there's this group that I can go to and ask questions. Um, and so we do ed monthly educational sessions. We do a weekly sort of uh, come join and hang and then do like a member hangout sort of a deal. Um, and anybody is welcome to lead any sessions. Um, and if people, and we already know that people have connected with each other to do brand deals, uh, from our events and from our membership. And so, and if people make money from it, great. If you just wanted to come and build a community to find your, find your group of people, your tribe, wonderful. Um, and, and I think, you know, there, there is a place for everybody. Um, the number one reason for burnout for content creators is feeling overwhelmed and feeling lonely and not knowing what your steps are. So you just stop doing it. Um, there are people out there who have suffered or have experienced the same things we can tell you this is how you outsource this is how you hire a va this is how i repurpose content have you thought about publishing a book have you thought about doing all these things because we're, we're so focused on our thing which is wonderful but when we get tunnel vision when we have blinders on we it's hard to see what's around us and that's what a community can help do to see your blind spots and to really help you get to the next level amazing no i mean it's uh fundamental crucial to to talk with others and and every day you just like you don't mention here so uh very very important too many people say that you know they don't want maybe to talk about certain things so they don't feel you know that it's the time or they don't want to do that but uh you will learn more ensuring than just keeping that for yourself right so um i would say that you know like you know again we we, we cover so many things congratulations on what you built you know uh jari in you know uh, you know, by the what up the White House, and you know, I've been kind of having some podcasts and doing all these things. And, and on top of it, like you know, the very important message that you have out there, you are you are working on something that is very, 
very important, right? Uh, for 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 everyone out there. So so thank you for doing that, and you know for educating people in uh, not only the creator economy, also but on the human being side, right? That too many people sometimes when it comes to business, they, they forget that we are all all humans, right? <laughs> so that is something. Um, is there anything else that you want to add today that I didn't ask you? Um, last thing or I think the wonderful thing about creator economy is that it, it is really one of the very few things in the world that anybody from anywhere can do. Um, I, I think we often feel very alone in the world. Uh, like I said, I'm 40 years old. I have two kids. Um, I don't look like your typical creator per se. Um, but I, I hear from people all the time saying, man, what you're doing is really dope. I wish I could do that. And I say, you can, um, <laughs> you know, to, to, to play numbers a little bit, you know, there's about 8 billion people on the earth. Um, there's a handful of people at, at a minimum, probably hundreds, thousands who look like you, who have shared experiences, who speak your language, who, uh, need to hear from you. And so, you know, it is, we, we, we only evolve as, as, as humanity because we share our lessons and to make sure that we can do things a little bit differently the next time around. And whether you are a medical professional, whether you are a corporate person, um, there are so many different examples and case studies of people who have really taken their knowledge and their experiences and to share that out with the world. You know, I, I think sometimes creator economy gets a bad reputation because they think that we're just funny, haha, entertaining. Uh, the true value of the creator economy is rooted in engagement and education. We make people feel like they matter and we teach people something. And especially on the business side of creator economy, that's where we get a lot of the value. And so if you are somebody who enjoys helping other people, and if you know something, or if you can teach them other something, even if it's just your language or food your whatever it is, do it now. Um, whatever the reports say, the creator economy will grow 2x, 3x in the next 5, 10, 20 years. Think about the way that we, you know, we're on the other side of the pandemic now, but five years ago in 2018, what do we know about the creator economy? Nothing, really. Because we yeah. know so much now, and so you're, you're never too late to start. And, and how do we make sure that we can uh, learn the transferable skills so that we can be uh, where we are uh, five years from now? And and so start today. Um, take it from a 40 year old guy with two kids. If, if I can do it, you can do it. Um, you know, uh, and, and it has been wonderful. It's been empowering, um, and you know, it has been really, really fun. And what I did. A year ago is not what I'm doing today. And so the ability to pivot and to grow and to learn has been really, really, really paramount. And, and last thing, there are always somebody willing to help you. And that's what makes this wonderful community and economy beautiful. Um, and so always ask for help be and help first. And, and that's how we're going to make this thing, uh, you know, keep going and, and growing and making sure that more people can participate. These positive remarks, thank you so much for sharing that. Very important for people listening today. I'm pretty sure they're going to find them useful. And I know that even even just with me, one person today is going to be, you know what? I'm, I'm doing that. I'm starting today. Jerry, thank you so much for sharing this with us today. Again, congrats to what you built. Best of luck with everything that you're doing. And uh, this was the Influence Factor by the Influencer Marketing Factory. And I'll see you next week. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Alessandro.